Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 23. All right, I'm really excited for this one because we went into our mailbag and actually picked out a question that we got from one of our viewers. So I'm looking forward to going through and hopefully answering those questions for him. Uh, my name is Ellis Hughes. I am a statistical programmer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward, and I do data analysis and sport. And you can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. You can reach the both of us and get into our mailbag at uh, tidy.explained at gmail.com, or you can tweet us at, at tidy, x, tidy underscore explained. Is yes. that what it was? Yeah. 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 Right. yeah, yeah. Great. All right. So this week's uh, question comes from Vikrant. Uh, and he was asking uh, about for or loops and functions. How to what? How to write those? How do we? How we approach those? And so what we did is Patrick went into uh, his big bag of, of R scripts and and pulled out a, a great idea on the Pythagorean Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean or, expectation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So we'll hop yeah. we'll hop over to that. I'm going to share my screen so Patrick can see what we're uh, talking through, and then we'll get this thing going. All righty. Yeah. So the best way to write for loops is to not write them. Exactly. Start with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, not, I mean. Sometimes you have to write them, but generally, if you can get away with not doing it, they are rather slow and um, can kind of slog through things at times. Yeah, the way the way that base or the way that R was written, the way that for loops work is they can be really efficient, but you have to do a lot of pre work around them. And so, at least I found the, the best way to write a for loop is to not write it, to think about a for loop how I'd want it to behave, and then use a different function like Laply. Um, or any one of those functions, or then, or using what out of per the the per package, one of the map uh, family of functions. But it's important still to understand how they work, so you can then move out of that. So, uh, Patrick, you can see the screen, right? I got you. All righty. So let's let's hop through this and start explaining how we uh, how we'd approach all of this. Um, so, like we said, episode twenty three. He's got his little yaml, his yaml there explaining what's going on in this R script. And then he goes and loads his libraries here. So first we've got tidyverse, the, the best package that everyone uses to, uh, to start data manipulation. We've got the here uh, library to help us set our working directory and paths out of that. The skimr package, which we've used in the last couple episodes to get a high level look at uh, the data that we have and, and the sub, the, what's going on underneath um, our, our data sets here, and then the library janitor, which is really useful for cleaning up column names, just doing general cleanup around it, and you'll see it used in a second here. Um, and then, as always, for doing our plots, we like setting the theme to uh, theme light because we think it looks well, it's one of the better themes that comes by default with that. So let's execute that. Uh, it's loading everything. All right. So next, we're gonna look at Pythagorean the Pythagorean wins formula for baseball, um, and so. We're we're going to be going through this, and we're going to try being trying to optimize how it behaves uh, using our for loops later on. Um, so we need to get a lot of data, and normally we'll go at this step. We jump on the internet and start pulling in a bunch of, a bunch of uh, data from a lot of different sources, doing some web scraping that stuff. This time, Patrick was kind enough to go through and pull uh, baseball data and, and format it nicely for us from 1980 to 2006. Uh, Patrick, do you have any background on that and what's going on? Uh, it was, uh, it, you know what, I I probably wrote this script like five years ago, and that was data that I just had on my computer, so that's kind of what I use. Uh, you could use any, I, although, you know what, uh, when we optimize this for the exponent, it, it probably won't be a valid exponent for this year, given they're only going to play 60 games. So, uh, But... <laughs> You could you could pull whatever seasons that you want. Um, actually, if you're trying to do this in other sports, um, it works the same way. Uh, you know, football, hockey, basketball. You can do the same type of uh, same type of approach as we're going to use. But the there is no significance to the date. Uh, the Pythagorean Women's Formula was something that was uh, initially came out from Bill James's work, mm, and gotcha. he started with the. Uh, as you'll see, the exponent that we initially use is three. That's where we're going to start, and then we'll optimize for that. But uh, 
yeah, no, no significance about the dates used here. I just needed to grab a whole swath of years of baseball, and that's what I had around. Yeah, that's a, that's a good chunk of years there. So we're going to use read underscore CSV from the read R package to, to load it all in. Uh, here, this, here's where the here package comes comes into play here. So this makes it really nice because uh, when you're compiling using it from an R markdown, it's going to use the path relative to the location of, of the file. So where the R markdown is relative in your file system. Uh, here uses, so as you can see, we are in an R project. So it allows us to then build everything out of reference to that. And so um, it, it, it makes it just a lot more consistent for other people if they pick up your script to try to run it. They don't need to have everything located in the same location and knitting your R document at the final uh, final way there, it'll it'll also continue to work as if it were interactive. Um, and then, so we're going to load that in, and then we're going to apply the clean names function from the janitor package. And so what that's going to do is it's going to look at the column names and clean them for us. So it, it's got predefined ways that it's going to make everything under uh, lower lowercase, right? Because uppercase stuff can be a little bit funky in column names. It'll also for special characters, um, it's got ways that it'll handle that. Like if there's a space, it'll turn it into an underscore. I think actually for most special characters, it'll turn it into an underscore. So it makes the names a lot cleaner for us. So we don't have to deal with funky names um, in the way that like if you were to read it with like the base R read.csv convert spaces into dots and then you get really weird names with that. So that handles that for us. So we load it in. Oh. What? That doesn't make any sense because it does exist. It's right here. Why Try are you? <sighs> Let's. You know this is live debugging. So oh, because I changed the changed the uh, the um, file path. So now you guys get to see us debug in person or live. There we go. That works. So yeah, I changed the column name or the the file path there. So always double check that before you <laughs> before you hop into hop into recording, right? So you, you loaded all our column names, and as you can see, there are a couple columns here that had uh, uppercases um, and whatnot. So what it did is now we've got baseball wins there. So it made them all lowercase and it replaced the space that was in like runs allowed and runs scored and turned them into underscores. So it's all very clean, very nice column names that we get using going forward. Um, and then we're gonna use the skim function from the skim R library there to get a, just a very high level look at the, the data that we've got going on here. Okay, so if we look at this, it's uh, got 748 rows and six columns, which is, you know what we we're expecting with the 26 26 years of uh, baseball records here we've got one character column which would be the team and then six numeric uh columns which are the statistics that we pulled for those years um we've got no missingness for teams so that's good so we don't have any any random team names there that we we didn't expect there and then we've got year which is less important for this wins um, so in losses, so if you look at here, the mean and standard deviation, just a quick logic check for those makes sense because for every team that wins, another team loses. So that makes sense for them to be mirrored. Um, and then the runs scored and runs allowed. Once again, the mean is identical, but the standard deviation is not because there can be teams that score a lot versus not. And it's, it's not as consistent with that, but the mean is identical. So that, that works for that. Um, and then you get, as, as with the skim R, you get this handy dandy uh, histogram there, kind of showing you the distribution. So that kind of is a fun thing to look at as well. Um, and now we're going to jump into calculating, just doing some initial data processing with the code. So Patrick, do you want to take us through this? Yeah, so the first thing that we do we're, now, we're working in uh, tidyverse as we always do. Um, we're going to add two new columns there to the end of our data set, a scoring ratio, which is, uh, as the name implies, the ratio of runs scored to runs allowed, and then the win percentage for each team. So wins divided by total number of attempts, which is uh, wins, uh, wins plus losses. So we'll go ahead and run that. 
and those will create a, uh, two extra columns in our data frame that give us information about the performance of the team in a given season. And we're going to move on now and we're going to calculate the team's Pythagorean win percentage. So again, this comes from Bill James. And um, you can see below that if you're ever working in Markdown and you want to make a uh, report look fancy and uh, put mathematical notation in, uh, the dollar signs on uh, bookending the equation allow you to do that. So I think if, if you hover over it, should does it plop out if you hover over it? Uh, no. Oh, on mine it does. Every once in a while it does that. I might have, be running an old old version yeah, of our maybe. studio. It'll come out as like a uh, uh, an actual equation. But uh, there it is. So this was uh, the, the original equation. Um, it's the scoring ratio to an exponent divided by 1 plus the scoring ratio to an exponent, which is obviously the way to take odds and turn them into a percentage. Odds divided by 1 plus the odds. Um, the exponent we've specified as I initially will start with three. I believe that was the original value that Bill James began with, I believe. So that's what we're going to start with. So we'll set I to three. And we are going to um, calculate our win percentage uh, based on the Pythagorean wins formula. So this is a this is a predicted wins percentage. This is basically looking at how the team performed relative to the number of runs that they scored and runs that they gave up and taking that information and trying to say this is the percentage win, you know the percentage of wins that we would expect for that team given the way that they perform. And obviously this isn't going to be perfect because there's lots of randomness in sport and so there's sometimes things that happen that um that go on that that cause this to not be exact but we'll go ahead and run that and we'll we'll take a look at the errors so now we've got our data frame and mm -hmm. um we could see at the end there we can see the true win percentage and so for example the diamondbacks in 2006 they look like they underperformed uh, uh, just slightly by maybe about 2% or just under 2%, right? So they won 46.9% uh, of their games. They had an expectation, given the runs scored and runs allowed, of winning uh, about 49% of their games. So um, it was a below average team, obviously, um, but they still played below that um, uh, below that uh, uh, expected performance. So if we were, you know, all things being equal, if the team stayed the same, which teams never do, we would expect some regression to the mean and maybe they would come up a little bit closer to that type of performance that we would have expected. But um, We can take a, a more kind of specific look at these errors by actually calculating the error out. So we're going to calculate the error as the actual win percentage, the observed win percentage, minus the, um, the win percentage that we projected for the team based on the Pythagorean wins formula. So we'll go ahead and we'll calculate that. And then we're just gonna create an, a visual of this. And so the way that I like to do, um, do this is just visualize this as a histogram with the uh, vertical line set right at zero. So obviously um, if the error were zero, it means that the Pythagorean wins formula was exact to what we would have expected are exact to what was actually observed, right? Mm -hmm. So the observed and expected are the same. Another way that we can look at this is to actually print both distributions. So this is a quick look of what it what we just created here, what he was describing with the vertical line here at the at zero, so no error. And so as you can see, we are off by uh, um, up to 10%. Or over ten well, percent for a couple in the, of them in the, in the tail ends, but overall we're not terrible. You can see it's normally the errors are relatively normally distributed around zero, um, but the, obviously there's some severe outliers where we you know we if we were doing this properly we'd probably interrogate that and figure out like well, what would have happened that could have caused the team to over under project by ten percent. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way to to visualize this is actually to overlay the histograms of the observed win percentage and then the um, um, the projected win percentage. And I actually did this and I borrowed a trick from our TidyX last week where to create sort of my makeshift um, my makeshift legend, I used annotate and fed in the uh, um, the actual color and, and the the words of the um, of the two distributions. So I uh, stole that from last week's. So I really liked the idea. So uh, this this uh, screencast isn't as is, is 
is as much for us as it is for you guys. Exactly. We always learn some new stuff looking at the way that yeah. people approach things. So there we could see the two distributions are relatively um, uh, you know, reasonably overlaid. Obviously, you can see that the uh, distribution for the Pythagorean winds formula is a little bit less peaked than the actual uh, wind percentage. And it's also, uh, you know, has a much wider tails on both sides compared to the actual wind percentage. Mm -hmm. But this was just our first first attempt. This is yes. we picked three and went, went with that. Exactly. We picked three. We started with three. So the next goal is, um, oh, sorry. The next thing that we want to do before we move on to trying to optimize this is we need something to optimize it against. So here I'm optimizing against the mean absolute error. So we calculated the error. We're going to take the absolute of those values so that the positive and negatives don't cross each other out. And we're going to take the average of that, right? If we took the average without taking the absolute, sometimes, you, you know, you could take the square root of this as well, you know, um, but we, we, we went with the absolute error here. If we were to run the mean over the error itself without taking the absolute, we'd cross out positives and negatives. So here we see that our mean absolute error is about 3.4%. So on average, that's where we're uh, our mean on average, our absolute error is about 3.4%. So the question is, can we find a more optimal exponent than three? How can we optimize this? And we're going to do this in, um, we'll, we'll give you three different ways to do this. The base R version, which is what I originally wrote, will give you a version that sort of combines tidyverse and base R. So it's like, one leg's in the pool and one leg's out. And then we're gonna jump all the way in. Final one is is no for loop. We're gonna do this straight on with tidyverse, which is the um, the Ellis preferred way. <laughs> it's just, you know, three different ways to think about it. And, you know, as you're building things up, I mean, I, I probably will first think about things in a for loop, like mentally, but then when I actually go to write it, I tend to write it in just tidyverse because I found that it's faster and easier for other people to read. Um, and I have to be more explicit with a lot of things. Um, but it's a good way to just kind of progress through the logic of doing, going from just a for loop into tidyverse and how to get between the two. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. So here we go. How do we optimize? Um, so the first thing that we need to do, uh, as Ellis explained at the start of the tidy, uh, of the, uh, episode to, to, do a good for loop, there's a bunch of pre-processing steps that you need to set up in order to get the for loop going. And so that's what we're doing first. So the first step is if I want to optimize against an exponent, I need to pick a range of plausible exponents to optimize against. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a sequence of values from 0.5 all the way up to four in 0.1 increments, right? And the idea here is that I'm going to run this for loop and I'm going to say calculate the Pythagorean wind formula and then calculate the mean absolute error for every single value in this sequence. So all of those numbers, it's going to produce a, a, a long list of numbers and that's what we're going to create. We're going to create a for loop that's going to try every one of those numbers and we're going to find the number, the, we're going to find the I exponent that minimizes that mean absolute error. So first thing we're gonna do here, we'll create our, our sequence of values that we're gonna use. And so there you go, I think it's like 36 numbers. Yep. Uh-huh, okay. Next, we need to create a data frame for the for loop. And the reason why is we want this data frame of values that we can deposit our mean absolute error into. So I call it mean at our MAE results, mean absolute error results. And I create this data frame and the data frame is basically a list of the potential exponents, the 36 values that we just created in that sequence and then results and the results column, I just leave as NAs because as the for loop runs for every iteration it goes through, it's going to deposit a value into the next NA for each of those exponents that it tries. So mm -hmm. create that cool little, yeah. And if you're going to do a for loop, if you're going to do a for loop, always do this. Pre-allocate your memory. Yeah, this, otherwise it's faster. <laughs> it's because uh, the number of loops, uh, I'll get into it in a, in a little bit once we look at the for loop. But this is going to speed up your for loop so much. Like it, it, it seems like a very small piece, 
to, to pre-allocate and be, generate this thing that you're going to be dropping the results into. But the way that R behaves, if you don't do this, it's going to try to chunk memory as it goes through. And that takes time. If When you pre-allocate your memory doing this, it is it already set a memory aside for this, so it doesn't then have to spend the time to allocate more memory. So sorry, that's kind of a tangent, but this this piece here is really important to writing good for loops. Yeah, it's a super important tangent, though. Always want to do that. All right, so now here we go. Let's write our for loop. Uh, the first thing I did just to make this simple is I extract the uh, only the three rows that I care about. So I don't really care about the teams themselves for this. All I want is wins, losses, runs scored, and runs allowed, right? The wins and losses will allow me to calculate the actual win percentage, which is our observed win percentage, and the runs scored and runs allowed is going to allow me to calculate our predicted win percentage based on the Pythagorean formula. And here we go, little spelling error. We're going to get into our, um, we're going to get into this uh, ugly looking for loop. So the first thing that you need to do is set up the for. So here I say, for i in one to length exp options. Oh, I need so, to. Sorry, that's I think a... the, uh, i options. Yeah, there you go. So what this is saying is it's saying for every i variable in length one or in sequence one to length i options, which is basically all of those values, I want to. I want R to go through and run this loop. So we're going to say, first calculate the win percentage, and now calculate the predicted win percentage, and here's where the for loop comes into play. I'm going to take the runs scored divided by the runs allowed. That gives me my scoring ratio, and I'm going to raise that to I options I. And so that little I is basically coming up from that for loop there where it's saying for I in one to length I. So I1 will be the first value in the in the uh, exponents there yep i2 will be the next value etc and so we create our predicted win percentage using those exponents from the for loop and then we deposit them into that uh, data frame that we created so the mean absolute results we put them right into that the uh, mean absolute error rather we dump it right into that um, that data frame that we had created. Mm -hmm. So this will drop it into the ith row in the second column. Second so column. the second column was all NAs. Once we run this, it'll then go boop, 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 and drop it into the second column for each I that we ran. And this for loop is going to be very fast compared to some of the for loops that I've written uh, before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we get MAE results. Oh, not a number. What happened here? Oh, because uh, these. Oh, it, this was the this was my old code, and we used the janitor package to change the names. So I had the original. Um, That's what original. you get. That's what I get for going through and just changing things. <laughs> it's okay. No right. harm, no foul. All right, so rerun. Uh, we must have missed one. So if you get a warning like this where it's like, okay, there's a bunch of warnings. If you don't know, the way you do that is you type in a warning or warnings. Yeah. Run that. So it's saying the column wins oh, doesn't yeah. exist here because be that lowercase. needs to be lowercase. But yeah, yeah. so that's, that's a quick debugging thing Ooh. there. There we go. No more errors. Woohoo. All right, so now we have a whole data frame of absolute errors. So let's investigate these uh, mean absolute errors a little bit. Oh, sorry. Okay, so now we're going to get into the next next type. Yeah, yeah, uh, go we, we got ahead of ourselves a little bit. Now we're going to look at the next sort of way that you can look through and do this. And this is going to answer the question about writing functions um, as well as uh, you know combining this with the for loops and whatnot. So the point of a function is to kind of abstractify and pull out a process that you're doing, if it can be repeated or it should be repeated multiple times, is, is to abstract it. I think David Robinson uh, actually was a person that I saw a tweet, uh, write, wrote a tweet like where if you have to, if you're copying and pasting it more than three times, turn it into a function. If you are asked the same question three times, write a blog post. If you're saying the same blog post three times, write a write a book. <laughs> Package or something like yeah. that, yeah. So, uh, so the idea here is 
we were we were applying the same Pythagorean theorem multiple times through here, but it's doing the same thing every time. We're just slightly changing one or two things about this. So we should write a function to do that. And so the way you write a function is there's a couple pieces to this. So first, there's this piece on the left there, and that is the uh, assignment. So this is what the object that's going to become the function. And so we're going to call it Pythagorean wins because that's what it's doing. It's calculating the win percentage that we'd expect based on the Pythagorean wins theorem. Um, next, you have function, and this is a special R declaration that's saying what I write next, treat it as a function and, and, and assign it to the left-hand side of this. Uh, next, you set your arguments. And so this is completely flexible. This is how you, the arguments that you're going to then be using in your function, right? And so you're going to want your function to be wholly self-contained. You don't want it to reference things outside of your function because that, that can make things really confusing and dirty. And I do not suggest that. So we know Pythagorean uh, wins the way that it's calculated is, okay, you want to know how many runs or how many points you scored how many points you were allowed, and then some exponent i to then be able to calculate your, your wins percentage there. So the arguments that we're going to be passing are points scored, so scored, points allowed, called allowed, and then i, which is going to be the exponent that you use. And so from that, we uh, just create that same algorithm that we were using before, but this time it's more abstractified. Um, we assign it to some object. And then a key word here in, in functions is this return. So this is then when it hits this, it's going to return that value and return it out of that function. So when you execute a function, most of these functions are going to have a return in there that's indicating to the, both the readers and to R return this value out of the function. So, so now we've created this new function, Pythagorean wins, um, that when we pass in uh, values, it'll give us the uh, Pythagorean win percentage. Yeah, we've on. written a few functions in previous, uh, I think I had some z-score functions, we had functions for calculating t values, so we, we've done it a few times. Um, I think you had some functions for web scraping. Yeah. Uh, well, there, there's it's, been a number of examples, Yeah. Uh, but we haven't, We probably haven't been explicit as we could have been in explaining. Yeah, sitting, sitting down and explaining each piece of it. But yeah, this would be considered like the body of the function. These are the arguments to the function. So there's a lot of different ways you can think about it. But anytime you're doing, you're repeating yourself multiple times, think about the elements that you're changing and turn that into a function. All right, so now we're still gonna, we're still gonna stay in the base R for loop type, but this time I am going to approach it from kind of like a crossing between the, the space base R for loop situation, combine it with my my love of tidyverse and the way you want to approach that, the way you think of data wrangling. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go for I in length uh, one to I options. This is the same thing that we did in the prior for loop where it's for each I option. But now we're going to go through and we're going to use baseball ratio. We're not have, we're not going to you know, subset and pull anything out of there. Um, and then we're going to mutate it and we're going to calculate a predicted win percentage out of that. And so we're going to apply the new function that we just created, Pythagorean wins. Um, the We're going to assign scored to be the runs scored um, in the baseball ratio data set. Allowed is going to be runs allowed. And then the I exponent is going to be whatever value out of I options. So the first through the 32nd or 36th, and we're going to run it for uh, for each or This will be running it for an individual um, field there. Next, we're going to su subset out both the win percentage and the predicted win percentage, which is the Pythagorean wins, um, and assign that to baseball ratio, op uh, baseball ratio options. We're then going to calculate the same sort of uh, mean absolute error here and, just, and drop it into MAE results as well. This is going to be overriding what we did before, but those values are identical because this function is this. We're doing the exact same thing here. This is just a slightly different way to approach it. So we're going to run that. This time we didn't get any errors. And we have the same data set here that we did before. So those are just two different ways to think about it. One's kind of functionalized, kind of abstracted, and one's the base R. Here's exactly what I'm doing.
two different ways. Okay, so now we can jump into looking at the results. And the last yeah. last bit we'll go over, uh, once we go through this, we'll go through maybe a tidy first way to do it. So looking at the results, we want to investigate the uh, absolute error, the mean absolute errors that we achieved from trying to maximize the exponent. So obviously that's just a look at the data set. Um, the next one here is, is uh, actually plotting the uh, mean absolute errors as a line. So on the X axis, uh, we're plotting, I think that should be an I. Uh, no, so M A E. Is exponent, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, so yeah, we're gonna EXP. Plot the actual exponent that we used and the corresponding mean absolute error uh, of that exponent. So we'll go ahead and plot that. And what we'll see is that for exponents that are very small, the errors are large, and then they begin to decrease. And somewhere around two, they bottom out, and then they begin to increase again. So if you remember before, we were using an exponent of three, and that puts us that that had like a 3.4 percent mean absolute error, which is right about what we see uh, right there. So what we want to do is we want to locate the exponent that is giving us the the uh, the floor of those mean absolute errors, the bottom, the lowest value, which is going to be right around two. So let's peel that out of our um, mean absolute error data frame. So what was the mean minimum value? We can look at that by itself. And it was um, the, the lowest mean absolute error that we achieved was 0.019. So about 1.9%. Actually, we're missing a zero there after the, <laughs> yeah. So about 1.9% um, and we can identify which row that is at right here. So we're gonna filter out the minimum result row and this will show us that our exponent, the, max, the uh, exponent that maximizes our, or minimizes the mean absolute error rather is 1.9. And so that would be the exponent that we would want to use to um, uh, make our projections here if we're looking at this baseball data. Mm -hmm. So going forward, if we wanted to kind of just relook at the results and go forward, we could do everything that we've done prior to this, but replace the three with a 1.9. And then we can look at the histogram and everything that's going on with that. Yep. Yep. All right. So now, right. so now we're going to jump into a more tidyverse approach to this. Um, this is rather simple because we're only looking at one thing that we want to optimize by, which is the I. Uh, but I work with a bunch of statisticians that work on a bunch of trial type work, uh, power size calculations and stuff like that. And they gave a talk uh, to my team a few few weeks ago, and they love to use this function called crossing out of uh, Tidyverse, where you can, so in this case, we only looked at I, so we only do it for one, but if there were multiple things you're trying to optimize, so I and then there's an O component or something like that, and a U uh, component, you could use this crossing. So it'd be crossing IOU, <laughs> and it would it would uh, create this big data set of all the potential combinations of that, and then you could dump it into this for or into this this next step here, and it makes it really simple to then have it execute all of them for you. Um, but in this case, this is like a very simple approach to this. This is the basic approach, and then you can grow from here. Um, so this is the same I options that we we're having before. So from 0.5 to 4 by 1 or by 0.1. Then we're going to use this map DFR function from per. So this is what this does is it's going to execute for each I that you pass into here, I option, um, execute it. And map by default will generate a list, right? So that's they wanted to make that consistent. Um, that was the point of per, but they have these modifiers as underscore something, and that then changes the output type. So map underscore dfr will always return a data frame. So that's what the df stands for. But they were they're going to be combined row wise. So this is very similar to. I think you've seen it in the past in past episodes a apply mixed with a do call r bind. And we're going to bind all the rows or bind all the data frames by row. Uh, you can also do uh, DFC, I believe. So map underscore DFC, which combines this way, so it squishes them horizontally. Um, and, but we're not we're not doing it this time. So it's the same sort of situation here. We're function i. So for every i option here, execute the same Pythagorean wins 
uh, function that we wrote earlier and pull it all out, but this time I'm going to return a tibble of the exponent, which is i in this case, and the results, which is the mean, ab mean absolute error. So we can execute this. And now we get a tibble of those same results. And then if we apply that same filtering mecha uh, mechanism that we did before to figure out what the uh, best uh, exponent is, we get the same exact answer. There you go. So that's just kind of a high level look at a couple different ways to build up loops and take it from the base R approach to a slightly more abstracted version to here's how you can approach it with tidyverse. That's it. Oh man, the light went out again. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this was a lot of fun to kind of think through again. Uh, sometimes, you know, we forget the, the process that we took in going from, you know, this base R to this then more complicated, uh, not more complicated, but more optimized version of the algorithm that we do. Cool. All right. So I think that's it. Patrick, do you have anything else to add? That's um, a very high level look at uh, uh, functions and for loops. There we go. All right. Well, thank you all again for listening to this. Uh, as always, my name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward, and you can find me on Twitter at, at OSPPatrick, or you can email both of us at tidy.explained at gmail, or reach us on our YouTube channel, which is, I think, where this question came from, uh, or hit us up on Twitter uh, at tidy underscore explained. And um, yeah. Uh, Thank, thanks for pretty, watching. Pretty Cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool to uh, get some mailbag stuff to answer for once. So <laughs> keep them coming. Yeah, keep them coming. Comments below, email us, reach out on Twitter. Thank you, and uh, keep on exploring your world.